Sachs Collection, Owen Sachs College, is producing uh, 25 very high quality uh, OER textbooks that meet scope and sequence requirements of the introductory courses, peer reviewed, professionally uh, developed. And uh, we're really trying to uh, improve access for students' learning. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, an important issue uh, legislation and institutional OER strategies to en enhance academic freedom. Uh, academic freedom and OER go hand in hand. Uh, but it's a very uh, delicate issue uh, in some quarters, and one that must be handled adroitly uh, and not manipulated by people who oppose uh, OER. Uh, so uh, we have a uh, we have a great panel. Uh, uh, we were going to have Dean Flores from the Twenty Million Minds organization. Unfortunately, due to other obligations, he couldn't make it here today. Uh, but uh, he's a real advocate for OER. Uh, we have uh, Bob Rilowski, uh from De Anza College. Uh, she's an author of a, a very widely used uh, uh, open sex college text, uh, statistics, a great OER advocate. At uh, the end of college, Barbara has already saved her students over $1 million. Uh, it's really impressive. And she's currently working in the Chancellor's Office, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we also have another great uh, panelist, Heather Wiley. Uh, she's a professor of sociology uh, out of uh, Shasta College. And she's been working extensively, uh, not only in her own course in sociology, uh, but across the campus uh, to build awareness and uh, drive the use of OER. So I think they'll have a lot of uh, interesting things to say. So very quickly, we don't have much time here together. Uh, we're going to talk about advocating OER and the campus experience. Uh, what are, what, how does that relate to academic freedom? Uh, what, what are we hearing in the market? Uh, then I'm going to pose questions to our panelists. And I'll have about three or five minutes to respond. And then we'll follow up with a great Q&A from you. Uh, so uh, let's get started. So uh, advocating OER and the campus experience. Uh, we've been fortunate being able to go out and uh, work with faculty and uh, uh, deans and the like on campuses. And some questions that we're getting around academic freedom. Why are you forcing us to do this? Okay, um, I'm concerned about mandates coming through legislation. Uh, aren't I the best one to make selections for my course? Uh, I mean, these aren't verbatim, but these are the general the types of questions we sometimes get. And I think they're important because they're white elephants. If we don't address these issues up front, uh, they won't hear anything else uh, that we're talking about. So, a couple things. Uh, all these questions, I think, are based on potential OER uh, people who oppose OER, because I don't know of any OER that is forced, legislated, or mandated. In fact, it enhances freedom. Uh, but it's a story uh, that we might not talk enough about. Uh, so how does OER enhance academic freedom? And this is from the OpenStax College perspective. And actually, this is taken from a slide that we use when we're presenting uh, to a faculty. At the course level, OER actually provides faculty with more choices. Uh, OER, you can, you can look at the traditional uh, materials and online resources from a publisher, and you can compare that to OER resources. It's another tool you can use. It expands your choices, not limits your choices. Next, OER allows for permission-free editing and adaptation, uh, which is really powerful when faculty realize this, because then they can locally contextualize that content. You know, a lot of um, schools, especially community colleges, uh, they're very concerned about MOOCs. Well, there's one thing a MOOC can't do, and that is really personalize the experience for the student. And they can do that at that local level. OER affords them the freedom to do that. Uh, and then finally, at the course level, uh, it prevents, OER prevents faculty from being locked into a, uh, a particular system, uh, because with most OER, you can use any system you want, um, or a particular platform. Uh, it expands those choices for them. So it's really like a new canvas, if you will, uh, that they can use. Uh, in, the, uh, um, in the marketplace, uh, the exact <coughs> college position is OER should not be legislated or mandated. Uh, that is counterproductive uh, to a constructive dialogue uh, with faculty. Uh, we believe that OER needs to stand on its own vis-a-vis -vis publishing materials. If our, if our materials do not meet your requirements, or do not meet your standards, guess what? They should not be used. It's as simple as that. Okay. Secondly, though, um, if we do get an objection about um, 
a, a content item, which you will, no book is perfect. And when we get that objection, I simply ask, well, is the textbook you're using right now perfect? No, of course not. And ours isn't perfect. The big difference is, is you can adapt ours in the way you want to use it. So it's a, it's a good conversation to have. So just a quick summary here. Uh, why do we care about this? Why is it an important part of the OER agenda? OER opponents frequently point out that OER threatens academic freedom. I've heard it, I've seen it, and this chorus will grow as we expand into the market. We mustn't ignore it, we must take it head on. Uh, secondly, OER will only go to scale uh, if the intent of the licenses are realized. If it's just take it and use it and really never ever adapt it, well then we're not reach, realizing the potential and the freedom uh, that this will usher in. And then finally, uh, mandates are not going to work in this market. Uh, it might sound great, you might be able to drive short-term usage, <coughs> but people don't respond well to uh, mandates in any market, especially this market. Okay, so, I wonder why that happened. Okay, so we're now going to move into the, um, the, uh, the, the question uh, component. I'll answer that one. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're going to start with um, Heather from Shasta. And so the question for you, Heather, is what is the, what is your experience of being uh, in adopting uh, OER uh, at your school? And then how have faculty responded? What are some of the challenges being? And how have you dealt with this, especially in regards to academic freedom? Sure. Um, you can stand up. So, um, as you mentioned, I'm a sociology instructor, and one of the reasons I'm here is that, um, apparently I was one of the first sociology instructors to adopt the intro to social programs <coughs> through OpenStax. <coughs> inadvertently, I've been looking for a material um, that worked for me um, and that students were familiar with. Right? I was used to lots of the, the sort of module approach, um, but that sort of scared a lot of students off. I've worked at a community college, and um, all, a lot of students don't have regular access to the internet. So anyway, I was excited when I got that. So that's what got me interested in it. Um, and I also started our campus um, textbook committee um, to address the, the issue of access. We did a poll on our campus, and the average amount a student was spending at our community college was $600 a semester, which is extremely prohibitive for a lot of our students. So we started this textbook committee, and getting to, to your question, David, is for the first couple of years, um, we were kind of getting patted on the back by administration and faculty, like, oh, it's nice, we have a committee. And, but it was mostly lip service that we were getting in terms of particularly advocating for OER, right? Because again, a lot of the same issues that I mentioned in the previous session, right? people didn't know what it was, <coughs> and you must have to have you know, lots of tech skills to work with that, and, and it's going to be super labor intensive, right, from a faculty perspective. It was only when our textbook committee started to package it as a student success issue. And I know that sounds kind of obvious, but we really started tying it into things like retention, all those buzzwords, right, that administration likes to hear. Um, retention, um, uh, success, um, I'm bringing out the, the jargon at the moment, but it was only when we tied it into the words they were looking for and used the specific data from our campus to show that, and I've been kind of the guinea pig on campus in my class to show that, yeah, this actually is meeting all those goals that you've articulated in our strategic planning. That's when we finally got their attention. Um, so we're still sort of in the early stages, but our administration is starting to tie in um, access to course material as part of our institutional goals as a campus. We're no longer a cute little committee on campus anymore. So that's kind of a, a broad answer to that. And um, I have the data for my own courses to back it up. Um, I, maybe I can share some of that later. But that yep, terrific, great. Uh, so Barbara, the question I have for you is, um, there's been there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of uh, work in California legislatively. Uh, there's been two major bills passed. Uh, it's been held up as the model, in, in, in one of the models in the nation. Uh, but there's been rumblings from faculty about how it could impact uh, academic freedom, their choice to run courses. So could you address that issue? Sure. Hi, I'm Barbara Olowski, and I'm an open textbook author. And I wanted to just add one other part to what Heather said. Uh, on our campuses, it's the same thing until we, we use the word equity, because that's a big word on the California community colleges, and increasing equity. And uh, because of the fact that 
the poorer students, who tended to be our students of color, were not able to afford the textbooks. So there was there's a discrepancy between who has the textbooks day one and who has them after three weeks. So I just wanted to add that one part. So California has two bills that have passed, Senate Bills 1052, 1053. And uh, I assisted, but well, Dean Flores really led the initiative with our Senate President Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg on these bills. I helped a little bit with the editing of the writing of them and testifying at the legislature on them. We have, we have these two bills. 1052 uh, provides for a council, and the council is made up of three members from the California Community College system, the UC system, and the CSU system. And unlike most other states everywhere in the country, California does not have a unified higher ed program. So we have a mess. We have um, the UC operates independently, and then the CSU operates, and then the California <coughs> operates. And hopefully they take each other's phone calls, but that's not always um, even the case, going from chancellor office to chancellor office to chancellor office. We do have an organization called ICUS, which is the intersegmental um, academic, sen uh, academic senates, which is some representatives from the three groups. So their responsibility was to form a council that would somehow be involved with finding discipline experts and being involved with the OER. The second part was 1052 was to actually build a library where the repository would be held and it was for the 50 highest enrolled lower division courses in the state. Well, the reality is the community colleges have 2.6 million students, so the 50th highest enrolled is going to be what's in the California community colleges, right? But, but we have such a high enrollment of um, pre-transfer level, basic skills level courses that this bill was really to be on the transfer level. And so were, there, were there any mandates in the bill about right. OER using? Right, so what I wanted to get to was that this project was to build a repository, build a library, find the resources to allow the faculty to be able to say, here are groups of, of open learning materials that have been peer reviewed and are here for your choosing should you like to see them. So we were not mandated. And, and part of the concern and why David asked me to speak about this is the concern is the California legislature says, okay, we're going to do this. And the concern from faculty was that then we're going to be required to pick these books. And then our academic freedom will go away because we're going to have to pick intro to SOCH from OpenStax. So or we're going to have to pick introductory statistics, which I think everybody should. You know, maybe <laughs> all them, but that's besides the point. Okay, but that we would have to do that. And so, so this bill does not say that. It's here's a library because what happens with the textbook committees? How many of you are faculty in a discipline that chooses textbooks? So just a few of you. But let me just at least tell you how it works. Is that the major textbook publishers and all of them send you hard copies of books, and a committee reviews them. And unless you have somebody passionate enough or savvy enough to say, here is an OER resource for this course, there's really just stuff out there. And the committee just says, OK, OK, you know, but if you can send me a hard copy, I'll look at it. So the concern is that, from the faculty point of view, is that we'd be stuck using this stuff that we really hate. Because you know the, the saying, um, you get what you pay for. Right, and so we'd be stuck using all of this. So that was the concern on academic freedom. I think it's been addressed. I think that there's, it's become enough in the mainstream that, uh, and I think another part that has sort of addressed it, which hasn't come out, is that open textbooks are not free. The foundations have paid millions and millions and millions of dollars to support connections, OpenStax College, um, the Carnegie OLI, all of these. So they're really not free. It's just changing where the money comes from on um, there. So there is great, great um, support in building these materials. And so that was the concern. So any, great, thanks, Barbara. Any, any questions uh, from the audience? Go to a few follow up if no one had any questions. Great. Um, I'm Melissa Hagan with the Open Society Foundations. And you mentioned that mandates will not work in this market. By this market, are you specifically referring to higher ed? 
Or do you also include K-12? Um, I'm really referring to the higher ed market because okay. uh, uh, the K-12, we know that there are adoption states uh, where they do select the titles right. uh, that the uh, the schools have to pick from. Okay. So, Can yeah. I add that to yeah. yeah. sure. mandates again? Okay, California, um, something actually really great that former Governor Schwarzenegger did mm -hmm was he developed the California Learning Resource Network. And so the, the K-12 are required to choose from the public schools from particular publishers that have been vetted and particular textbooks that have been vetted. And they've all gone through. But he, he established this so that if, faculty, if high schools, well, K-12, were not going to be spending their materials fees, they could go to this CLRN website and pick textbooks that had been approved to be used. So for example, the collaborative statistics, we had to submit it, and for the, it was passed for um, general statistics and probability in junior high and high school, different chapters of it, and then for the AP statistics. And so what it meant was that the high schools, if they were gonna pay their materials fees, they had, they're mandated to choose from certain publishers and certain texts, but if they were not gonna be using fees, they were allowed to choose from these. So that's sort of a little bit of a, a difference. Right. And I think that, that distinction is really, really important. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I don't know if this is slightly off topic, hopefully not. Um, not everyone is teaching to a textbook. Right. So what, what's happening with all the other materials that uh, in the disaggregated, you know, disaggregated content uh, category? So I can, I can address that. The UCs and the, and the CSUs and with every state the universities, they have a lot of freedom to decide what they want to do. So if I'm at UC Berkeley, for example, and I put together learning materials, I don't have to worry about that course transferring because the students aren't transferring to UC Berkeley down to the community colleges. So they transfer from the community colleges up to the, co to the universities. And we have articulation agreements. And in our articulation agreements, it says you have to give the textbooks by ISBN that are there so that when the, um, the higher universities, the receiving universities, do your articulation agreement, they look at the books and they say, is this appropriate for a college course? So about five years ago, I worked with the articulation officers from the California state system and the UC system because um, one thing I've learned working in the chancellor's office for two years and I go back is that everything in government is very slow. And so they're understaffed just like so many offices. So I thought, well, I'll just, you know, it's, sometimes it's good to pretend to be naive or stupid or whichever way you go. Because, oh, I don't want to bother all these government people. I'll just go directly to the person who I know who's in this office. So we work so that the articulation agreement now gives a place for the ISBN numbers or the URL. Now, here's, here is one thing that happened because Merlot was out of the CSU system and it has a great listing of resources. We got as far as the general acceptance being an open textbook. If you could give a URL with an open textbook, then the receiving institution could look at that open textbook and say, yes, this is quality enough, we're going to accept it. So with collaborative statistics, the fact that it's used in a lot of community colleges, but it's also used in the UC system, which I didn't know about until um, Lisa told me about her daughter at UC Santa Barbara who was using the book and at the CSU system. So that was a sort of a no-brainer for the articulation agreements. But if I were putting together, for example, a course on health, and I was taking a little bit from Center for Disease Control and a little bit from here and a little bit from all these different things, the way that I would get around it, because I can't put a list of everything, is I would get around it by, in essence, making a reader. But it would be a virtual reader where I would have one page which says Health 101, and then I would put those resources in it so that what the URL that would go to the receiving institutions would just have that one part. So there are ways to do it, but so far the higher ed organizations in California have just said, well, if you can give us an open textbook. I think the tides are changing. I mean, this was already five years ago that we did this. I think the tides are changing, and pretty soon it's going to be courses, whole courses that are accepted. So I got a quick question for Heather. At Shasta College, uh, I know a lot of administrators, they feel the pressure, the affordability pressure. And they probably go to faculty and say, what are you doing, hopefully they do, to address the affordability issue. How do faculty react to that when it's a negative reaction? How do you balance you know, the need to do something with academic freedom? Sure. So we've had kind of this perfect storm 
um, happen on our campus, it's been good for me, um, that a lot of our faculty have been sort of doing their version of OER, but totally illegally, right? Um, <laughs> uh, that always, uh, oh, it's under the fair use. Like, actually, no, it's not what you're doing. And, um, so our campus bookstore, um, we got a new manager and really came in sort of guns blazing with, okay, you all are breaking the law and you can't do that anymore. And it's created this um, pretty um, antagonistic atmosphere with faculty, like, wait a minute, I've done it this way forever, and here you to tell me I can't do it that way anymore. And so I've ridden in on my big white horse with OER, like, hey, I can help you out with that. So, um, so it's been this really great opportunity for us to address, like, yeah, I know you've been doing putting that PDF up on your course, you know, Moodle page, but you can't really be doing that anymore. But here's an equivalent that you can link on your Moodle page. So um, that's actually didn't necessarily come from administration. It kind of came from our committee that addressing that grumbly, and which totally tied into the academic freedom issue because, as Dan mentioned earlier, so much of this OER actually. Um, supports academic freedom as opposed to challenge it because it does, you know, you've got these cracking down over here saying you can't do that because of copyright and then OER coming in saying, well, you actually can because of the open license. So that's been a great selling point for us. Great. Is there a question in the back? I have a question that kind of plays on what an observation of that you just said. My observation is that, and I assume we're looking at the AAUP definition of academic freedom. Mm -hmm. I think there's a really poor understanding of what that document actually says out there. And my question following that is, does anybody know or is anybody working with AAUP if they had any kind of statements on OER? To kind of nip this in the bud because I, I hear academic freedom thrown around a lot by a lot of faculty members. I'm used to be one of them, and they don't know what it really means. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100%. They don't know what it means. Um, and it becomes this very defensive, ugly, Mm -hmm. way to, to say no. Um, but in terms of Do you want to enlighten us to what you think it means? Well, it's a complicated question. Yeah. I think if we really go back and look at that document, which is a complicated and complex document, um, it, you know, I don't want to get into a big debate about this, but I'm not sure that the freedom to be told by a textbook committee what textbook to, to teach in your class. Yeah. I think OER does actually support academic freedom, but but because of that, I'm, I'm curious, does anybody know if AAUP is safe doing anything about it? So I did meet with them about six, seven years ago because, not because of OER, but we had an issue on our campus with, um, I think on most campuses, when you're teaching in continuation courses, the fact, for example, I'm in mathematics, we use calculus, so we have four terms that, that we have we're in the quarter system four quarters of calculus, and most faculty will agree, they do a vote, and they agree, okay, we'll all use the same book for all four quarters. And we had a faculty member who said, no, it didn't actually matter if he chose the book that he wanted, whatever book, he would be using a different book. <laughs> because he knew what was best for students. Now I brought in, you know, I personally think that um, it doesn't really matter what book I teach out of, including my own. I find whatever book, I, what, what we're required, whatever, what's there, and I teach my class. But I don't want students to spend $240 on a calculus book for the first quarter, and then go to another class and spend $240 on a calculus book, and then 180 on this for the third quarter, plus it's bad learning with the notation being different and the topics beyond it. So, so I had many discussions with AUP because I was department chair. And, um, and I was on the statewide academic senate. And what they said is faculty have total right to choose the textbooks, but departments can decide in continuation courses that they could all agree to do a majority rule. But here's the caveat. The department had to agree unanimously that we would all agree that a majority rule was so. <laughs> so it didn't quite work. So back to OER. There is no, there's, how it relates to OER is that unless they've recently had some adoption, but as of a year or two ago, there is no connection with open ed resources so far as using it. Um, the, the, and, and none of this really matters in essence until you're coming from a community college or a system that's going to transfer to another one. Because if you're at the receiving institution where the students are graduating from, 
you have a lot more flexibility to do what you want. Unless you're, for example, unless you're from in a nursing program, you have to pass state and national boards. But it's when you're at a community college and you're transferring to a state university that this whole issue comes into a, a real play. All right, that brings us uh, right to the end. Uh, thanks for the you know, great questions and, and insightful discussion. Uh, but if, if, you know, we leave, if everybody asks you about OER and academic freedom, it simply enhances it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much.